Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Taking Care of My FRAR Clothing. Can I Mess It Up? Sponsored by Bulwark. My name is Barry Botino, and I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health magazine. I'll be your moderator today. Thanks for joining us. From our team here at the National Safety Council, which is currently working remotely, we hope that you are all safe and healthy amid the COVID-19 pandemic. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items. The views of today's speaker and organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean that the council or the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session with our speaker. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time at all during the presentation. You do not have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but we might not get to every question. Uh, rest assured, any questions we don't get to, however, will be forwarded along to our speaker. If you happen to have any technical issues during this webcast, please refer to our list of helpful tips, which is located on the right-hand portion of your screen. For basic troubleshooting information, you can also click the Help button located at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. This webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past safety and health webcasts, you can visit us online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's introduce our presenter. Our speaker today is Derek Sang, who serves as Technical Training Manager at Bulwark Protection. For more than 20 years, Derek has been involved in the FR clothing industry in a variety of roles, including the service, manufacturing, and garment sides of the business. Derek also stands above the crowd as an educator and a speaker. He's developed more than 250 informational and educational seminars on the hazards of arc flash and flash fire, and he's produced more than 40 hours of training curriculum for Bulwark University that cover a wide range of FR, FR clothing topics. Again, we thank you all for tuning into this presentation. And Derek, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Barry, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And good morning and or good afternoon, live or archived, however you are consuming this today. We certainly appreciate you taking your valuable time to do such. So with that, let's get started. The topic today, taking care of my flame-resistant arc-rated clothing, can I mess it up? All going well in the 45 to 50 minutes, we'll get you that answer. In the short term, got to take care of the legal stuff. This presentation is for informational purposes only. Customers of Bulwark Protection are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard risk assessment to identify safety hazards in their work environment. Customers of Bulwark Protection are solely responsible for selecting appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly and in conjunction with the appropriate gloves and footwear. Because working conditions and other factors may vary, Bulwark Protection does not make any representation that these garments and protective gear will protect wearers from injury. So on to the good stuff. So again, welcome to our webinar. What's the premise today? When we're out in the field and we're talking to our end user community, those that actually wear our shirts, pants, and coveralls for protection against short duration thermal events, we get tons of questions, especially in and around how to properly select this stuff, how to properly uh, wear it, how to properly care and maintain it. So today, in our short time together, We'll cover kind of who's responsible, some of the top 10 things to do because not everything is a law, not everything is in the standards. Sometimes it's just what are the best practices based on our 40 plus years of experience on this and how to do it right. We'll cover mosquito, uh, mosquitoes and ticks because they're always popular and that vector-borne disease, uh, disease season seems to be getting longer and longer. 
And then, you know, how should we select, you know, home laundering? Is it okay to do that? Should I look to industrial laundries? What are some things that I can put into a selection process? We'll cover those. And then ultimately, at the end of all this, we'll answer the question. So a few definitions, because we are like a lot of folks, we use acronyms like crazy. The industry in and of itself, the marketplace in and of itself uses them sometimes correctly, sometimes incorrectly, sometimes we just mush them all together. So fire retardant, there are no such thing as fire retardant clothing. Fire retardant is the chemistry that goes into fabrics to make them flame resistant. Uh, so flame resistant is the byproduct or the end result in a garment form that what does it do? By definition, it self-extinguishes, does not support combustions. Once the ignition source is removed, it does not melt, drip, and add to the industry. So that is your FR garment. Old terms that you still hear out in the marketplace, you'll still have folks kicking around inherent and treated. What does that mean? Back in the day, at the purest of its definition form, fibers do not support combustion. Fibers need additional finishing to not support combustion. So one in and of itself, no additional finishing, did not support combustion. One we had to take and add something to it, so it did not support combustion. Today, because we have such a blend of technologies and we have so many hybrid fabrics in the marketplace utilizing fibers from uh, different sources, we now have to really focus on their engineer to have flame resistant properties. You can engineer at the molecular level. We're familiar with those. You've got your legacy fibers like Nomex. You've got fibers like Kevlar. You've got at the fiber level where we've had to add our what? Fire retardant chemistry. When it's still a soup, before we extrude that fiber, we add fire retardant chemistry. So the end result is you have a fiber that is flame resistant. That's our motocrylics, our rayons, et cetera. And then we have our cellulosics, primarily our FR cottons. At the fabric level, we add the FR chemistry. At the end of the day, they all do what? They self-extinguish. They do not support combustion. They are going to not melt, drip, and add the injury. Ultimately, they're going to do their primary job, and that's save your life in a short-duration thermal exposure. Uh, we do hear terms like uh, FR and arc rated is additional testing that goes into flame resistant fabrics. So first we establish that it's flame resistant, self extinguishes, does not melt, add, uh, drip or add to the injury. And then we do additional testing to show that it w can withstand and insulate against an arc flash. That way we have arc rated garments. You'll hear me use FRAR, flame resistant first and AR arc rated. So let's get on to the, can I mess it up? The FRAR properties of today's proven suppliers are for the life of the garment and therefore durable, not just to laundering, but also to wear and tear in the field. Uh, it's key to understand that you can and cannot do as aware and what you need to be aware as an employer, but today's flame-resistant arc-rated garments is not the PPE of 25 years ago when we had basically just four to five what we call today legacy fabrics, legacy fibers that dominated the market. So the apparel that we utilize today uh, wasn't even in our uh, vocabulary back then. So who's ultimately responsible and responsible for what? Uh, when determining who's responsible for worker and workplace safety, it's important to note that most laws, if not all laws and regulations, point to who? The employer. That includes everything from getting the right gear, ensuring your people have the right gear, educating them on what the right gear is, making your spec for the right gear, how they wear it or use it in the field, training them on it, all the way through care and maintenance of, of the PPE. Ultimately, regardless if they home launder it or you have a third party take care of it for you, as the employer, you are responsible for that PPE. What tells you that? Well, the law tells you that. 
The regulations say in 1910-132, the employer shall assess the workplace to determine if hazards are present and are likely to be present and which necessitates, necessitates the use of personal protective equipment. So then you have to choose the right PPE for the job and then you have to train them on how to utilize the PPE for the job. As with your hazard assessment, industry consensus standards may be used to guide that selection process, guide that training process, and we have a bunch of really good ones that have a long time in our marketplace. NFPA 70E for our industrial electricians, uh, 2112 and 2113 for short duration thermal exposures uh, and fire full from uh, dust, gas, vapors, or ignitable liquid, primarily in our oil and gas side of the business. And then ANSI 107, when we have to go to high vis and we have to have FR components within that high vis, that's a great standard to help guide us there. So we do have a lot of uh, guidelines to help us understand how to properly get this stuff and where to start looking for what's considered quote unquote good stuff. The easiest place to help understand where to start looking is understanding what the labels are saying and more importantly, understanding an incorrect label to knock something out. And what do I mean by that? My original statement was it's really hard to mess up FR today when you're looking at top providers. How do you determine if someone's a top? Well, they're following all the standards and regulations. They understand what to communicate. They're doing things per the standards. So the inverse of that is when you get funky labels and when you get poor communication. Those are easy knockouts because if they can't do the simples, how are they going to produce something that ultimately is designed to save your life? So with that, having a basic understanding of what the labels are telling you is key. So for example, ASTM 1506 gives us as manufacturers a lot of direction on what to communicate because there are very important things when you go from a retail garment, which is clothing and primarily is not PPE, to PPE, there's a lot of things we need to make sure of. Things like tracking and identification codes, things like communicating what that has been tested to and what it can insulate and protect you to, who made it, where it was made, what rating did it obtain. All these things are key, first and foremost, to get something that's going to do its job. But then secondly, if you happen to be involved in an incident and you want to know or someone wants to know if that garment did what it was supposed to do and what it's been tested to and what it communicated to you, you have to have a chain of custody. You have to have the ability to track that that shirt, pant, and coverall to where it was made, when it was made, and most importantly, where are the archived test results of that fabric that it was composed of to see if it met or exceeded what the current standards were and where it was implemented. There is a whole bunch of required labels, whether you're on the arc flash side or the flash fire side, and they have to be communicated concisely and more importantly, accurately. They have to demonstrate if there's third-party certification in there, like you see in the UL logo on the one on the right. We have to communicate in concise and specific manners what that is able to do, because that will give you the pedigree, kind of the resume of that garment. So that's a good place to start when you're looking in that selection process. So back to the training piece. When is it necessary and what exactly is necessary? 1910-132 gives you a list of what you need to ca uh, communicate to your people and more importantly, what they have to do in a feedback loop to you to demonstrate that they understand the training and you can document that and follow the law. So as we look to those things, there are how to properly don and doff a flame-resistant arc-rated garment. 
the biggest thing we need to communicate to our end user community is not so much what it can do, is what it can do, can't do. What are the limitations of a seven ounce shirt and a nine ounce pant that happens to have flame resistant properties? You definitely can't go into burning buildings and start saving babies in a flame resistant shirt and pant. But it is designed for short duration thermal exposure, more easily communicated as escapability. What can it, are my expectations of this garment? And if the hazard is greater than the expectations of the shirt, pant, and coverall, then we have a mismatch of PPE to the hazard, and we probably have to layer up, ear up, or get completely different gear, or we don't do that particular cat, uh, task in our shirt, pant, and coverall. Proper care and maintenance of flame-resistant arc-rated clothing is essential for effectiveness. Most industry recommend following the instructions uh, provided by compliant garment manufacturers. There are some standards if you're out there looking specifically to uh, find guidelines to this. ASTM 2757 is for home laundering care and maintenance. And yes, absolutely, you can take your garments home and care for them. Uh, your everyday, all day shirt, pants, and coveralls that you're utilizing. If there's no concern about what contaminants you're, you're bringing in there, if there's not that to where we don't want that to leave the facility, if it's just your regular workday clothing, yes, you can absolutely take care of them. If you need to use uh, an industrial laundry, if you want to have a third party intervention or intervention that's a little extreme if you want to have a third party utilization to participate and partner in that absolutely can do that also and there are ASTM guidelines for our industrial laundry partners within the standards specifically they all speak to utilizing both utilizing either or and they it would be nice if we had one collective to tell you how to do these things but most of them as I said will tell you to follow the manufacturer's guidelines the manufacturer's guidelines are in the labels in those garments if you can't find them can't read them all the top manufacturers on their web websites you can download PDFs on how to care and maintain this stuff but as you can see they're all very very similar uh, Laundering per 1449 per 2757. Laundering or dry cleaning with frequency so to prevent buildup or contaminants, and then washed at least once prior to initial use. That one is kind of should be more emphasized on. In fact, you should probably, as a general practice, wash everything that you buy for the first time before you wear it. Why? Because there's sizing involved, there's trans things, there's a whole litany of things that you can get off of those initially, that you want to get off of those initially, just in general practice. And then in the FR world, we definitely want to wash them at least one time, because remember, all those performance capabilities are laundered at least one time. That means all the sizing, any chemistry that's on there, any byproduct of the uh, actual creation of garments on you want all that off and uh, not part of so don't put it on brand new wash it at least one time here is your laundry label here's where we tell you and summarize all the things you should do or can do to have a properly functioning piece of PPE so read those labels like I said if you can't or they all should be there uh, but if you can't read them or you want to create a policy for having them reviewed by your people, just get the PDFs from the manufacturers. It's easy enough to do, or you can create your own. They're very, very simple. As we said, there are a few things that if you do correctly, it is very, very hard today to mess up flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. The cool thing is, is we've gotten to a point to where we have manufactured out a lot of the concerns of 25 years ago because why we are uh, utilizing the strengths of a lot of different fibers in the makeup of this PPE to where we're minimizing a lot of the cons so you can take care of this and take care of it relatively easy 
what are the basics? The basics are don't use uh, chlorine, don't use peroxide, don't use fabric softener. You do those three biggies on a regular basis and your FR is going to do what it needs to do for a extended period of time. As you can see here, we have six, and of the six, only one is acceptable. That's the one right there in the middle. That's just your standard liquid laundry detergent. Stay away from what? OxyClean. That's a sneaky way of saying peroxide. Peroxide and our bleach will what? Weaken the fibers. What's doing all the work? Your fiber integrity. You are withstanding a arc flash or a flash fire with what you are wearing to work that day. And if you think about it, it's pretty amazing with a 7-ounce shirt, a 9-ounce or 12-ounce work pant that you're able to resist thermal energy for a short duration so we mitigate your injuries. So we don't want to be weakening those fibers that are ultimately do, going to be doing all the work. So that's don't do bleach, don't do peroxide. The other ones are going to either add an accelerant or mask the ability of the FR to do it, what it needs to do. So what's accelerants? That's things like fabric softener, whether it's in the liquid form or it's in the dryer sheet, you're adding an accelerant uh, to your FR properties. Things like starch, really any kind of additive that you would put on, don't do it. Liquid detergent, wash them, dry them, you're good to go. So again, into that best practices. Uh, I mentioned the biggies, but what are some other things that, that you can do? So we talked about bleach and peroxide. Don't do that. Don't add any kind of additives like starch or any kind of external things after the fact uh, that would go on your garments. Wash them separately. Is that a huge thing? No, not really. But again, you may be, just from a best practice standpoint, you may be bringing stuff in from work that you don't want to uh, intermingle or cross-contaminate with your family's clothing. Uh, just really a best practice, uh, as you would think of. The old adage used to be that, hey, I'm transferring non-FR uh, fibers and threads to my FR clothing. You're not going to have uh, you'd have to have a massive amount of fuzz and a massive amount of non-FR threads on your clothing to have any kind of after flame effect and a thermal effect. So that was really kind of not really a strong reason. The best reason is just not from a cross-contamination standpoint. Uh, turn them inside out. Color fastness. Do you want to keep your colors rich? And that's across all really garments, but again, it's a good practice. Uh, use liquid detergent for the best results. Does that mean you can't use powder? No, it doesn't. It just says, hey, if you can, use liquid detergent. Avoid the hottest temperatures. Again, we're minimizing things like shrinkage. We're minimizing stress on the fibers that are doing all the work. Uh, tough stains. You can soak them in uh, your liquid detergent. You can use your spray and wash on there. You can shout them out. You can do all those things. You're not going to mess them up from that standpoint because you're laundering them and moving forward. Uh, you can even dry clean. Uh, definitely bulwark garments and all really top manufacturers' garments can go through dry cleaning. And then tumble dry on low settings. Don't over dry. And if you do have a fuel or lingering odor coming out of that, rewash them. We have magnets and we have other things that can help for uh, home laundry for just simple reminders. You can tape the uh, uh, reminders to the uh, to your washer dryers or it's it's like I said these are best common sense practices. Just take basic care of them and they're going to do what they need to do when you need them to do it. Uh, reading the labels of what you're putting on there, remember I said avoid any kind of additives. Uh, when you start thinking about insect-borne disease and insect-borne disease uh, seasons, mosquitoes and ticks are the huge ones. There's a whole bunch of others, especially if you're in certain uh, areas where you might have things like midges, chiggers, uh, you know, gnats, those things, uh, and you're looking for something to repel those, DEET is a no-no. DEET's flashpoint is about 300 degrees in wet and dry. You are putting an accelerant on your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. Don't do it. Uh, what are your options? 
There's a couple manufacturers out there today. We're one of them, and there's a few others who actually have garments that are imported with uh, permethrin. Uh, they have permethrin in the actual garment, which is an insect repellent and will uh, knock down insects. It's EPA approved. So there are those out there. There are permethrin based spray on again. Okay. From an additive standpoint, yes, you can do it. I struggle with it a little bit because there's probably more negatives to doing it that way than there are positives. What do I mean by that? That is for spraying on clothes and gear only, AKA a best practice is to lay it down in your garage or on the back of your truck bed before you spray it all on, let it dry, and then step into it. How do we do it in the field? We go, uh-oh, forgot my, uh, to put on my spray on, forgot to put it on my uh, insect repellent, so we'll have our colleague spray us down. So we sit out there in the field doing that magical pirouette with our hands extended out to our sides and elevated, and then we spin around, and we're spraying permethrin on us, as we're spinning around, it's getting in our hair, it's getting on our skin, it's getting in places which are not ideal. So I would rather have it as part of the garment, but if I am going to spray it on, make sure that we do it on the clothes when they're not on us. This is another question we get. Okay, FR guy, how much is too much? We're out and we're doing this task and now my clothing is saturated with secondary accelerant. Is it going to work? Easy answer, absolutely not. If you are wearing, as you, if you are in this picture and that's obviously secondary accelerant and there happens to be a flame source, that FR shirt pant coverall is not going to work. There is no way it is overwhelmed with accelerant, can't be done. So what do we need to do there? We need to, once we immediately complete that task, we need to get out of harm's way and we need to get changed. Uh, going about our day-to-day -day activities, what should we be concerned about? Buildup of secondary accelerants. Uh, well, what about after I wash my gear? Uh, it's discolored, it's stained. Those in and of themselves are not an indicator of reduced protection. They're not an indicator that you have compromised your flame resistant arc rated properties. Uh, so monitor accumulation of secondary accelerants throughout the workday. After laundering, how can I tell? Well, remember, secondary accelerants, we're typically talking about fuel. You're going to have a fuel-like odor. If you take your clean garment and it still smells like fuel, Ladies and gentlemen, it is still fuel. It will be consumed in a short duration thermal event, possibly hurting you more than you necessarily needed to be hurt. So if it smells like that after cleaning, wash it until that odor is gone. And if you can't get rid of that odor, get rid of the garment. So here's a quick picture representation of what I've just been talking about. We have soiled garments. Let's take two scenarios. That is during our work day. The garment on the left, I have got Kyrosol. I've been climbing poles. I've been working around. It carried a, a barrel of something, and it leaked on me. If that is an accelerant, that is a no-go. Get me out of the bucket. Get me out of the area. Get me immediately into where I can change or out of harm's way. If it's a utility enterprise, I come out of the bucket, I'm on the ground, I have the flag and it's stop and slow and I take care of that. If it's in my chemical petrochem area, I am gone back to the locker room and I'm changing out of that garment because I'm not going to work in and around a thermal hazard with that much fuel on me. The picture on the right, conversely, throughout my workday, those are going to be little hot spots. If there is a short duration thermal exposure, could you have some ignition in those small areas? Yes, you could. The FR clothing, the FR fabric in and around it is going to self-extinguish, will not continue to uh, ignite and burn. So could you have something like that, arguably, that throughout my workday, that is, uh, I'm comfortable taking on that, that hazard? Yes. Uh, that very well could be. So 
Again, discoloration and stains when clean in and of themselves. If both those garments came back clean and those are just stains, I am not concerned about your flame-resistant arc-rated uh, performance. If throughout the workday I'm accumulating secondary accelerants to that point to where that picture on the left, that would concern me. So repairing or replacing, we always get asked because now we're into that proverbial gray area. There is nothing specific in our regulations, in our standards on repairing and replacing. So we want to make sure that throughout the life of that garment it fits correctly. Whether we're growing bigger or smaller or that garment is getting a little bit of shrinkage in it, in it over time, we always want to make sure that it doesn't that it fits properly and fitting properly means that we want to have a little bit of air gap in there air is an insulator so we don't want our flame resistant arc rated clothing too tight and we definitely want it don't want it too loose that it's a hang up hazard if we have to climb we always want to check the integrity of our garments we're looking for tears rips loose seams holes etc and then stains we just finished talking about which ones are going to concern us prior to laundering and after laundering we always want to keep some old gear around. Why? They make great patches. Uh, you want to have an old shirt and an old pant, and because why? The standards do tell you if you are going to repair, it has to be like material and flame-resistant thread. Most of us today can hop on the internet, get ourselves some flame-resistant thread in the appropriate colors. Uh, the easiest way to get the fabric of like materials is utilizing uh, your clothes that you've, uh, you've previously retired. So since there are no specific standards on what the rules are for repairing and replacing, here's some key examples. And as a best practice, you might want to posterize some of these in your locker rooms or pass these out on your, your FR, AR clothing, PPE sign-up guide or, or part of your training on what you consider as the employer of things you can and cannot do. Because remember, going all the way back, who's responsible for the PPE? And just like you wouldn't let a colleague walk out with a big crack in their hard hat, missing a lens in their safety glasses, only having half their uh, hearing protection, having their steel on their steel-toed boots showing, having a rip or a fray in their fall harness, this is the same. If you notice it, if you see something, say something, a.k.a. Get out of that gear. You can't wear that. You wouldn't let them climb in a fall harness that was red barren, worn, had uh, frays on it, don't let them wear flame-resistant arc-rated clothing the same way. It's not a huge undertaking. We make PPE decisions all the time on what our people can and, sh and cannot wear, what they should be utilizing in the field, and what they can't be utilizing in the field. Same mindset when it comes to this. So lower picture in the red shirt, we have thread -borne. That cannot be repaired. What you're seeing there is actually the plated layering of that particular shirt. You outer layering has worn out, and we're seeing the plating underneath. That needs to be replaced, cannot be fixed. We have rips on the seams, one on the shoulder, one on the leg. That leg is pretty excessive. I would say that's well over three inches, probably closer to a foot. Do I want to take on the task of repairing that myself or getting a new one? The other one on the seam is fairly reasonable. Could I repair that? I have the, the threading at home. I could do that. Again, you've got to make the decision. There are no absolutes, but here's what we at Bulwark tell you to do. That's an OK sign. And the OK sign represents the size of hole and the length of tear that you can repair, and you're allowed one of each on each garment. Because I, why? I have to give you a limitation, otherwise you would be having as many of these in some cases as possible, and we don't want to do that because, again, these are life-saving pieces of equipment, and we don't want to mess up the integrity too much. So what do we allow you? One hole the size of a nickel and one tear that is three inches. So let's go back to the previous examples. That tear on that leg is well over three inches. I would not be repairing that. I would be replacing that. 
the holes on those sleeves are not holes that is thread borne, I would be replacing those. That hole or tear on that shoulder, I could make the argument and I could replace it, and that would be the only tear that I'd be allowed to repair on that garment. So there's your rule of thumb. Three inches and a nickel, one of each on each garment. If you have two holes, repla replace it. If you have two rips, replace it. One of each is what our rule of thumb is, and then go on. I would preferably not have you make any repairs on a piece of life-saving uh, equipment. I wouldn't want people repairing my flotation device. I wouldn't want people repairing my fall harness. Hence, I wouldn't want people repairing my shirts, pants, and coveralls because they're all going to be doing the same thing. Because remember, we build them to be used in a life-saving situation, hoping you never have to use them for what I build them for. So, on to laundry practices. Uh, when should I consider an industrial laundry and when should I consider home laundry? These are not absolutes. These are very general guidelines, but some things to think about when you're making that in, uh, evaluation because they're both equally as good. Uh, you can make the argument that one point of uh, inspection, one point of repair, one point of upgrade is great, but if logistically I can't get there, all those pros are not really pros for me. So things to think about. High soil environment. Uh, I have contaminants. I have heavy soils. I'm really using these as FR and soil protection. Industrial launderers have higher water temperatures, stronger chemistry, longer durations, can do a great job of getting those uh, high soils out. Contain contaminants we've talked about. We prevent them from going home. We prevent them from becoming part of our private vehicles, etc. That's a good choice. The logistics makes sense. Heck, they're right around the corner, close proximity to facility. Their service area is within all my locations. I can have repairs and upgrades done by a single source. Uh, I have a high turnover of my people. I can get into bulk programs. I can do other things that will help minimize uh, my PPE investment. Simplified product line. I don't need my guys having 20, 30 different color decisions. We're, here's our corporate colors. Here's what we're going to do with. Here's how we can separate between production and operations and et cetera really easily done, so there's a lot of pros that way. When should I consider home laundering? Low to medium soil, we don't get that dirty. There's really no concern with what we do, taking contaminants, uh, home, private vehicles, things like that. Logistics are a challenge. My people's service area is pretty wide and it doesn't coincide with uh, the industrial laundry's uh, footprint. I have low turnover. My guys have been with me forever. You know what? We want flexibility in our program. I want to be able to spend my allowance on a variety of different things as long as they meet the safety uh, specifications that my company's established. I don't want to look the same every single day. I want to have a choice. I want to have access to the latest and greatest technologies, and I don't want to get locked into a multi-year uh, contract to do the simple thing. So some advantages there. At the end of the day, you may need both. And at the end of the day, all the top providers, especially on the IL side, are so flexible and are so comfortable between their direct sale programs, their uh, not our garment programs, and their specific programs. You can, with a little consultation and a little time, you can build some pretty uh, flexible programs that can adhere to maximizing the advantages. You might have a production facility that meets all the criteria for an IL. You may have service guys who meet all the criteria of home program. There are ways to solve it out there. So take a little bit of time and consult with some industry subject matter experts and you can solve a lot of these things today. So my checklist is when you're looking at proper selection, first and foremost, when you're looking at selection process, get that manufacturer's guarantee in writing on letterhead and signed about what this stuff 
is going to do. And make sure it's guaranteed for the life of that garment and not adhere to any standard or regulation. Why? Because standards and regulations all have minimums. You want that garment to be able to have flame resistant as long as you're wearing it and as long as it has integrity, it's going to work. Ask for the test data to, uh, to make that real. All your fabric suppliers today and all your garment suppliers today can easily get you all the test results and data that go along with what they do. The certifications, likewise, what are they certified to? And, and then make sure that you take time and verify any of this thing. The cool thing is, is four or five mouse clicks and you can pretty much verify the legitimacy of what any uh, sales or representative of a company tells you that this garment's going to be designed to do. Then make sure you only allow certified compliant garments on your job site to what your specifics are. What do I mean by that? Just because I have one or two garments that meet what you want does not mean my whole catalog does or my whole product line. And just because they occupy the same page on the catalog and you need NFPA 2112 compliant garments, that doesn't mean everything on that catalog page or web page does meet those requirements. So be a little cautious there. Work with proven supply chain partners. What do I mean by that? Whatever your criteria is for proven, work with those people. Because remember this, everybody is great if nothing happens. Remember, these shirts, pants, and coveralls are meant for protecting people against unplanned events. We don't build electrical equipment to blow up, and we definitely don't want to have our oil and gas and chemical facilities having short duration flash fires, etc. We build this stuff to protect you when everything goes wrong. When your hierarchy of safety has failed, AKA your last line of defense or the clothes on your back, that's when your supply chain comes into effect. Can you get me 10 years of data on my fabrics? Can you track my shirt, pant, or coverall? Can you get down to the micron level and tell me how hot uh, that fabric got? What was it exposed to? Were there any secondary accelerants involved? And ultimately, did it do what you said it could do? So work with proven supply chain partners, then periodically police your program for compliance. So as I said earlier, it's pretty hard to mess up good flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. The asterisk or the comma or the concern, this pertains to market-proven suppliers and manufacturers. Flame-resistant arc-rated clothing today, regardless of how it was engineered or the combination of engineering that goes into it, are for the life of that garment and therefore durable, not just to laundering, but also to wear life. And how did this happen? Thanks to the changes in regulations, thanks to our very, very liquid and constantly updated standards, and more important, thank you to you, the marketplace, that demanded that we got better and demanded that it got more sophisticated. Extensive testing and development around protection, comfort, and durability. And notice, it's, we have to protect you first, then we can start worrying about comfort and durability. Uh, 25 years now, really, of moving beyond those original four or five legacy uh, fabrics to where we are today and driving uh, to improve comfort and durability constantly. And really, that is thanks to our end users. A little bit of bonus here. We've got a few minutes before Q&A. I threw this in here because we're getting a ton of questions in and around flame-resistant arc-rated clothing during the coronavirus uh, virus pandemic. A few slides because this is a presentation in and of itself and ultimately needs much more time, but I do want to make sure I address it because it does lend itself into taking care of our flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. So in my opinion, four things, one big don't, and three do's that you should think about. The one big don't is don't share your PPE. As common sense as I hope it is now as we are six months into this, arc flash hoods scare the daylights out of me because a lot of folks share arc flash gear. 
They'll have their all-day, everyday shirt, pants, and coveralls. Every electrician will have his own rubber gloves and his own leather protectors. They'll have their own hard hats and face shields in many cases, hopefully their own balaclavas, and then they'll climb into the one extra large flash suit that we have for everybody on site, and everybody's putting their heads into that contained environment to where who knows what's been breathed into it. Get your own, uh, especially in hoods, get your own PPE. Be cautious about balaclavas. That's another item that I see people uh, sharing. Everybody has their own uh, balaclava. Hard hats, face shields, you can argue, yes, you can clean them, yes, you can disinfect them, but if everybody had their own, they're cleaning and disinfecting their own. They're not having to share those. So be very, very cautious about sharing PPE. Handling your flame-resistant clothing, arc-rated clothing in a COVID world. Uh, number one, do. If you have no concern during your workday, if you have not come in contact, don't feel that you've come in contact, everything went copacetic, uh, just follow the manufacturer's guidelines. Take, bring your stuff home, get out of it, put it into the, the washing machine, wash your hands or sanitize your hands and go on about your day. Why? Are we kind of cavalier about it? If 20 seconds of hot water and soap is going to take care of coronavirus on your hands, definitely the hot water and uh, liquid detergent in your washer for 30 minutes is going to take care of the coronavirus on your clothes. Then I'm going to throw it in a hot dryer just to make sure I've applied enough heat. As I said, there's lots of ways to uh, destroy this virus. It's use a term, it's kind of wimpy, it's not that very robust. So doing simple things, take care of the virus from that standpoint. If you do have concerns, obviously uh, make sure that you're removing it in a uh, an area to where you're not putting it in contact with other stuff. You definitely don't have other people around. Do not shake your clothes try to get them off with as little disruption as possible. Do them in an area that you can go back to and sanitize if possible. Then again, same rules. Wash them separately. No additional uh, sanitization is needed. That liquid detergent, that hot water, and time do an excellent job of, of destroying or rendering the virus ineffective. And then we're going to throw it in a nice hot dryer for an extended period of time just for uh, additional uh, heat. Uh, again, isolate clothing, remove, uh, CDC recommends removing with gloves. If you can't have gloves on hand, just make sure you wash your hands prior to and again after. Follow good uh, hygiene throughout the whole process. Go back and sanitize the area that you were just in and you should be good to go. Sanitizing tools and equipment. Uh, this gets a little, from an FR standpoint, this gets, we've got to put a little extra step in there and have a little bit more thought. The CDC recommends, obviously, one-third cup uh, bleach to water, diluted solution to take care of tools and sanitizing uh, surfaces where and when it makes sense. If you are doing that on a truck or in an area, I would much rather you remove yourself from the hazard. Why? Then you can remove yourself from your very expensive flame-resistant arc-rated clothing you should not be getting bleach on. Uh, if you can't get out of your expensive flame-resistant arc-rated clothing you should not be getting bleach on, take an old flame-resistant arc-rated coverall, put it on top of that, and use that during the duration for any kind of accidental overspray, all those things. Uh, if you have the ability to disposables, a, a arc ray disposable, again, we're adding expense, but that's another option. If you can't do any of those and you accidentally get diluted bleach solution on you, the FR guy in me tells me, yes, you should be concerned. In reality, because it's diluted, we've done enough testing because you need to know you haven't compromised your very expensive flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. Do I want you doing it this way all the time? Ideally, no. If you do get ex some accidental overspray, even to the point of slight sl saturation, we've done enough studies and back my colleagues at Tyndale did extensive studies utilizing twice the concentration, and we had no compromise 
from your flame-resistant arc-related clothing, even to double the concentration, even to what we would consider saturation levels. I do not want that to give you permission to go around bleaching your flame-resistant arc-related clothing because you should not be. But you need to know in that these difficult times, utilizing a chlorine-based product for sanitization, that if you get accidental spillage, you don't need to run around and start replacing your $100 uh, flame-resistant arc-related shirt. So with that, uh, we've left a few minutes, so I'm going to uh, repeat what Barry said. Hey, if we don't get to your question today, the good folks uh, send me all the questions. I'll get you the answer. If you ask me something that's outside my expertise and I can't answer, I'll let you know, but understand we've got a lot of resources. I'll take the same question, and I'll try and find you an answer or a resource in a follow-up email. So with that, Barry, handing it back to you for Q&A. Great job, Derek. Thank you so much for all this uh, wonderful knowledge that you shared with us today. Uh, just to our audience, remember, if you'd like to ask a question, simply go ahead and type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click that button for Submit Question. I also want to remind everyone of our evaluation survey, which you should be uh, appearing on your screen momentarily. Uh, your feedback is really important to us because we do use that to improve our future webcasts. If you don't see your survey on the screen right now, go ahead and turn off your pop-up blocker, or you can also access the survey by clicking on the survey button, and that is located on the lower right part of your screen. Now, Derek, let's get to a few questions here. Uh, we have a question that came in from, from Dennis about care for his FR clothing, and he had an interesting um, item he wanted to ask you about. Um, so he, after washing, he does follow the your, your suggestion to uh, use liquid detergent, no additives whatsoever, and he prefers to hang his uh, clothing to dry. And the reason why is he says his family uses dryer sheets, and he's afraid that if he puts his FR clothing in the dryer, perhaps there might be some leftover chemicals from that dryer sheet that could impact the clothing. Is, should he be concerned about that, or can he go ahead and put that in the dryer, or should he continue to hang it dry? Great question. Um, hang drying, obviously, in and of itself, perfectly good solution. If you've got the ability to do that and it's less drying time, less use of dryers, better on the whole overall environment, that's great. Uh, should you be concerned about any residual from dryer sheets? Really good question. It would be minimal. Uh, could you arguably say that I'm throwing my you know, five shirts and five pants from my work week in there, and I'm banging around on the same uh, mechanism that just had dryer sheets in it. Could there be small amounts? Absolutely. Uh, but understand that when we talk about dryer sheets and when we talk about fabric software, it's accumulation. It takes quite a bit uh, to create the kind of after flame that would concern us. Now, don't read into that that Derek said it's not an issue. It can be, but we're talking about something that you'd be using the actual dryer sheet on your stuff to soften up your FR because why? They're scratchy and uncomfortable, and I'm going to use this every single time, and eventually, you know, four or five months or 10, 25, 30 launderings and dryings later, I've accumulated enough to where I might uh, have a hot spot or an after flame that would concern me. That's what we're talking about. And the reason we tell you don't do it is because if I give my wearers an inch, they're going to take them a mile. If I tell you you can do it 10 times, you all are going to push it to 20. And if I tell you 25, you all are going to push it to 50. So we tell you not to do it. So incidental contact with something like that in this specific case, I wouldn't worry about, in all honesty. Uh, if folks have, now the next question I get is, well, what if I did accidentally do it with a washer, with, with a dryer sheet? Rewash it. That's the easiest way to get rid of it and then dry it without a dryer sheet or do what you do in this case is hang dry it. But to your question specific, should I be concerned about the residual effect? I would say no. Great. Thank you, Derek. Um, Britt has a question, and in, in you spoke a little bit about the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis that we're in right now. And of course, all the public health uh, groups out there are suggesting cloth face masks for folks. 
but should workers be required to wear FR uh, rated face masks? Really good question. Uh, we have a module coming up that talks extensively to that. So let me just be as brief as I can in this format. Flame resistant cloth face coverings are a must, a must for folks that have short duration thermal exposure. So if you're required to wear flame resistant arc rated clothing because you are constantly do that, the mask on your face has to have flame resistant properties. Uh, if you are practicing social distancing, if you are a lone worker, uh, do you have to have a flame resistant cloth face covering on when you are 10 feet up on a pole and your colleague is on the ground 20 feet away? The answer would be probably not. Uh, but if I'm working in close proximity and I am within that six foot that we all are familiar with, yes, you should have a cloth face covering. If you have a thermal hazard, you have, should have a flame-resistant cloth face covering. Uh, so the flame-resistant properties where it will not ignite, melt, or drip, or add to the injury need to be there because anything other than that, you don't want stuff melting to your face. You don't want stuff definitely igniting on your face. So make sure that you have cloth face coverings, and in this case, that have flame-resistant uh, properties. Uh, most of the stuff that's being built today, and you should have access to a lot of them, everybody that I've seen are utilizing fabrics that we're currently utilizing in our clothing. The next question is, well, what about breathing through it? Well, one, they weren't built to, be, uh, to, to have folks breathing through them. We don't know a lot about what that's like to wear it for four, five, six hours. Now, we should only be wearing it when we're breaking that six-foot rule. If we have the ability to take it down, that's great. If we're inside an arc flash hood, you don't need a cloth face covering. You now have a self-contained environment. Now, if you're inside an arc flash hood that you're sharing, maybe you should be wearing it. If you have a face mask that you are bringing down, maybe you can pull that down or use your balaclava as your cloth face covering at that time. That all being said, there are a lot of additional information that, that we can talk back and forth for, but look for stuff from manufacturers that are already fo uh, following uh, Okio Tech 100. They're already passed or don't have to report to California's Prop 65, meaning they don't have any carcinogenics. Uh, they're already ISO or utilizing some kind of manufacturing guidelines. And then look for fabrics that are already being utilized in, in and around or on the face already. We have tons of uh, fabrics that are used in balaclavas. If that was a cloth face covering, I wouldn't have a concern. We have tons of fabrics that are used as neck shouts that are on our skin all day long already. I wouldn't have concern with those, and I wouldn't have concern with folks who are already at the top tier in the FRAR manufacturing world. That's who I'd want to be getting my flame-resistant uh, cloth face covering from. And whoever asked that question, uh, don't hesitate. That's my email at the bottom. We've done a ton of work. We have a ton of resources available to uh, the workplace in and around flame-resistant cloth face coverings and what you should be looking for. Great. Thank you, Derek. We have time for one more quick question here uh, before we close for the day. Um, Chris was looking for a clarification. Um, he asks, can FR clothing be laundered with non-FR clothing? Can it be mixed together in the same clothing bin? Okay, so back in the day, and I'm dating myself, when we first were doing this really in 2000, when we were first doing this in 95, the rule of thumb was wash separately. And the reason they gave you that is you didn't want transference of non-FR threads and fibers onto your FR clothing, which I guess in theory sounds like oh my gosh, I just got a bunch of lint from my non-FR sweatshirt transferred to my work shirt. But then again, if you think about it, if I'm in an arc flash or a flash fire, how much non-FR lint or what we used to call ooze or fibers or loose, not, how much is there that's going to be vaporized 
in the second, there's going to be no after flame. There's going to be no resulting injury from having that on there. It really was a very, very poor way of saying, don't wash your work clothes with your family's clothes. And the rationale that we gave as a marketplace back in the day that's kind of manifested its way through, even still today, is we don't want to cross-contaminate non-FR threads onto our FR clothing. How much loose threads and byproducts are you potentially, even if I took everything out of my lint trap and placed it on my FR clothing, that fuel is going to be gone in the first nanoseconds of an arc flash or a flash fire, and it's definitely not going to sustain any kind of thermal exposure to where I'm going to be hurt. So it was a very, very, uh, it sounded good. It sounded like something that you should do, but really it's nonsensical when you apply it to what the hazard is. The best practice, what we're really saying, is don't wash your work clothes with your family's clothes for cross-contamination. And that's all the things that you could potentially be bringing home. So it's more the inverse. Not that my family's clothes are contaminating my work clothes. I would just not rather contaminate my family's clothes with my work clothes. So hopefully that's a clarification of a kind of urban myth that perpetuated through our industry for years. But if you accidentally did it or you're pulling out your you know, your arc rated shirt and you notice that there's, you know, a bunch of the kids pajamas have been, you know, spinning around in there with you. Should you panic? I would say no. Okay. Thank you, Derek, for that. Unfortunately, folks, we have run out of time today. I'm sorry we did not get to everyone's questions, but as Derek mentioned, all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded along to Derek for his responses. Uh, once again, I hope you take the time to fill out our evaluation survey and share your input with us. That ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank our outstanding presenter today, Derek Sang, everyone from our sponsor at Bulwark Protection, and all of you who listened in today. Have a safe day.